Hello, and welcome back to Hemophyte Breakdowns. Today, we're going to be talking about Colin Maraglio. So Colin is a fencer from Ireland, and I wanted to showcase his style of fencing, particularly because he has a very unique style that not a lot of people give enough credence to, and I think a lot of people could benefit from trying to emulate. So watching how he fences, we're going to break this down again the same way we always do, starting with the Zufecton. So if you watch this exchange, there's a lot of time spent in the Zufecton, and you see classically what you see from people who fence like Colin, which is maintaining a distance that is just a bit outside of what they think their opponent can reach, but not moving very quickly or very far forward or backward. And the reason you want to fight that way in this particular style is that what you're looking for is to stay in the pocket. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but going back to the Zufecton just for a second, the reason that um, this particular stance is being used, despite the fact that the other person is in a bit more of a squared up stance, is that linear footwork has the advantage, especially if you use what I hesitate to call a more Olympic fencing style of foot movement, aka always having one foot on the ground and using one to basically move the other. So every time one foot is moving, the other one is down. If you move the back foot to go backwards, then you pull the front foot back. If you move the front foot to go forward, you pull the front foot with you, stuff like that. And what this allows you to do is make very, very fine, stable, and safe movements with your feet that also can be very, um, not tricky, but uh, in a sense, they don't tell your opponent what exactly is going to happen when you attack. Because oftentimes, what I'll say is that your lunge is measured from your back foot and not your front foot. So if, like, say you do a piece of footwork like this, you move your front foot forward, but your back foot hasn't moved, well, actually, you haven't really gotten that much closer. Sure, your sword has gotten an inch or two closer, but if you extend your arms all the way here, well, you're still probably not in range. And if you extend your arms all the way out here, you're also still probably not in range. But what that tells your opponent is that you're coming. And sometimes that's enough to provoke a reaction. For example, someone trying to engage with your blade because they're afraid you're going to stab them. And these little footwork tricks, moving very, very tiny amounts forward and backward, but always keeping one foot on the ground, ensures that you can change your direction very quickly, very rapidly, and transition into a full-on attack, a full-on lunge, or a full-on retreat if you need to, depending on the reaction that your opponent gives. So moving on a bit from uh, the Zufecton, and we're going to watch this exchange one more time, what I would describe Colin is as an in-the-pocket fencer. Now, what does that mean? So in-the-pocket is a term that I think comes from boxing. And what it primarily means is, I guess you could compare it to George Silver's True Times, basically meaning that the pocket is the situation in which both people are at the range and the distance and the capability to hit each other pretty much equally. And this is exactly the kind of situation I would talk about as being in the pocket. Both fencers are well past the point of each other's tips, as in they could easily just pull their sword back and hit each other you know, freely however they want, but they're not so close that they're grappling, and they're not so far that they have to actually reach to hit each other. So the idea of being in the pocket with boxing is that, you know, obviously when both people can punch each other freely, most of the time... You want to be in this situation because you feel as though you have the better infighting than the other person. And that goes, again, to for HEMA. But there are certain techniques and certain plays that you utilize when in the pocket in HEMA that can do something similar to having good infighting in boxing. Namely, offense combined with defense. Because when you're in the pocket, you have to be throwing attacks. Otherwise, your opponent is most assuredly going to be throwing attacks. But if you're throwing nothing but defense, well, there's a good chance due to the distance that you can pretty much hit anywhere you want. So you have to be very, very careful about what defense you throw because chances are if you're only throwing defense, you can be easily faked out of it and just played into a corner and beaten to a pulp. So you have to be on the offense when you're in the pocket. But again, there is another bit of a catch-22. If you're nothing but offense in the pocket, well, you're just going to get hit as much as you're hitting you're going to basically mince each other to pieces and the only winner will be the person who can best tolerate the pain. While that's a thing in boxing, we don't have that in HEMA, thankfully. So being in the pocket means using strikes, specifically certain master strikes, 
to have offense and defense simultaneously and to throw strikes that are not only effective at hitting the targets that you want and can be changed to different targets depending on what's open, but also to be able to put up a defense immediately after that strike is landed so that you can stay safe from whatever afterblow is coming at you. Because again, if you can hit them, they can hit you. So once you parry that afterblow, well, then you have to start throwing one of your own. And Colin does a very good job of keeping that together. So if we look at another exchange, we could see an example of what sort of techniques lend itself best to being in the pocket in HEMA. And that is going to be the Zverkow and the Hang and Parry, as you can see demonstrated pretty well there. And the reason that these are so good at being in the pocket is that if we go back and we watch how this exchange really started, we see uh, the fencer on the right basically throw a thrust that gets parried halfway through. And we see this high bind where both swords are basically bound upon their strong and in a position where cutting and thrusting with either of them is going to be very difficult. Maybe you could have been able to plunge this tip down in, but chances are in situations like this, uh, you don't really have the time or the space to properly pull your hands back and land a thrust. So what's going to happen from here is the first thing that has to happen is that someone has to disengage this bind. And that is where the hanging parry always and probably always will be one of the best movements for disengaging from a bind that is either disadvantageous or you're just it's just neutral. And the reason it's so good is because it simultaneously spills the tip so that a person who is putting immense amounts of strength or power into the bind to try to keep it there is going to slide down no matter what. But also in that it keeps the hands high by only dipping the tip and keeping the hands up where they need to be so that a follow-up strike, whether it be a Zverkow, an Oberhau, something else, can always be thrown from that exact same position that you use to spill off of the bind. So what you get is a position where if you go back to here and you imagine that both people tried to pull back and stab, well, neither one would likely be able to land a stab because they'd both be trying to pull their hands back to get their point in line, but also that they, if they wanted to uh, parry their opponent's thrust, they'd have to similarly dispel their own thrust in order to do so, which results in a situation where you can't attack and defend simultaneously. So the hang and parry allows you to do that. Now, the other thing that happens here, and in this particular case, this is a Zverkow, Oberhau kind of thing toward the upper left, uh, upper left opening, upper right shoulder of the opponent. The great thing about being in the pocket, again, going back to the boxing example, is that you can pretty much hit anywhere you want, anytime you want. And the reality of that is that if you're the first person to attack when in the pocket, the person on defense has a lot of problems and a lot of places they have to cover. Theoretically, this attack could go anywhere from the top of the head, the top of the shoulder, where it goes, lower into the body, or even lower into the leg. And the simple fact is not all of those positions can be covered by any block, let alone one or two blocks. So the person on the defense here now has the impossible choice of sometimes just guessing or having to be fast enough to parry that first attack, hoping that they get there in time, but most importantly, being unable to defend it without throwing an attack, well, while also throwing an attack of their own. So after this attack lands, and honestly, I'm just going to labor under the uh, assumption that it didn't land for the purpose of talking about the, the combination, the afterblow comes because again, when you're in the pocket, you can hit them, but they can hit you. And anytime you hit somebody, you know the afterblow is going to come because it comes just as quickly as defenses can come. So here comes the afterblow coming straight down the pipe onto the head. And here we see Colin utilize another hanging parry. And the reason the hanging parries can be so effective is how much area they cover and also how they so easily transition from the end state that the Zverkow put you in. So in the texts like Lichtenauer, you see a lot of tech, uh, things written about the idea of throwing a master strike from one guard to another. It, you know, that's not really what it says, but that's the gist of it. And a lot of times people don't, I don't think, take this section as seriously or think about it too much. And sometimes that's with reason because some of them don't always make sense. But this is one of the ones that makes absolutely perfect sense. When you throw a Zverkow into an opening that is across your high line. So if you throw a left Zverkow, that crosses your 
uh, left side and it ends up in a right ox sort of thing. Well, when you're in a right ox, one of the easiest things you can do is dip your point over your left shoulder and suddenly you're in a left hanger. And it's the shortest possible distance that you can have to go from the end point of an offense into the beginning point of a defense. So when you're in the pocket, these kinds of efficiencies of movement are absolutely necessary. Otherwise, those afterblows are going to hit you. So after this hang and parry gets thrown and the counter cut gets thrown, you're going to see another thing about being in the pocket that makes things so difficult. And that is even after this very good hang and parry was thrown and the cut was stopped, you can see how quickly and easy it was for the other person who was again still in the pocket to just pull their sword back a little bit and deliver a cut to an opening that you know you can't parry. From this distance, from this place where uh, Colin is, these hands cannot ever possibly get low enough to parry that. And more importantly, both legs are here. So you can't possibly void them both. And again, for the purpose of you know the discussion, we're going to assume that this leg shot hit, which I don't actually think that it did. But the more important part is even if it did land, this is another key feature of in-the-pocket fencing, which is target prioritization. The reality of being in the pocket is that you cannot defend everywhere, and if somebody wants to hit you, they will. But if they are going to forgo defense, your priority cannot be trying to defend something that is indefensible. Instead, you have to make sure that there is an adequate punishment and threat coming in at the exact same time. So if we go back to this hang and parry, right after this defensive made, uh, you know, in Olympic fencing, he'd have right of way, he'd have priority, it would be his turn to fence, but that's not the reality of fencing. So when this person just pulls their hands back and goes for that second shot, they can do that. And the reality is that there's nothing saying that this is not possible, this strike would be perfectly adequate quality, but the only thing you can do to stay safe, in a sense, is to make sure that they know if they're going to pull off and throw some little strike to whatever opening they can find, that they are going to be hit in a better target at the same time. You might argue about whether or not that's good fencing or clean fencing or whatever, but at the end of the day, if you are fencing in the pocket, this is the reality you face. And if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a strategy for what you're going to do when you're there well, then you're just going to double each other somewhere where you're not happy with and you're not going to get your points and more effectively, you're not going to feel like you had a good fencing match. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is what you would consider the weakness of this style of fencing. And it goes back to all the way to the zoofectin and the footwork. When you're making tiny movements with your legs, one of your vulnerabilities is the exposure that you give your opponent in staying just outside range. And basically what that does is it often baits your opponent into overextending and throwing something that maybe they can't recover from. And that follows into the plan pretty nicely. But if they're sneaky enough with that attack and they commit heavily to either a feint or they just throw some wacky stuff... It's often that this linear footwork and this short, you know, bursty linear footwork can't really get certain parts of your body out of range effectively enough to stay safe. So when you watch an exchange like this, again, whether or not this hand shot actually lands, you can see that trying to go into the hang and parry and waiting for somebody to have committed forward didn't really work out here because despite the fact that this person has committed pretty heavily to a hand shot, they're not really in the pocket yet. Both people can barely reach each other with each other's swords, but the reality is that this is not the fencing that Colin is going for. This is not the position where he feels most comfortable, and the reality is that throwing that hand shot and then getting out of the way potentially saves him and gives him a free, you know, attack online. Regardless of whether or not, again, either of these shots land, this is a situation where trying to wait for the pocket to come to you can cause some problems, namely that if you don't have a method of getting to the pocket, you know, you might get picked apart from the outside. So what do we look at when we're looking at adapting to this style of fencing? Because obviously hand shots are things that happen all the time. That adaptation, in my opinion, is the Zorn Ort, and specifically the method and the knowledge that whenever someone goes for your hands, they are effectively throwing an attack at your cross guard. So what we see here is 
what was really more of an attempted thrust, but the principle is the same, even if this was a, like a short little attack, a choppy hand shot right to the hands here, it would have landed right in this cross guard. And the shield how, or this Zornort, depending on how you want to phrase it, does a perfect job of zoning people out on that side and keeping them in the distance, in the pocket that you want to be in. And in this same situation, you see some of the same beginnings and endpoints that you see otherwise. You see a left ox-ish kind of thing. And you see from this left ox a attempted hanging, although the tip was stuck in somebody else's head at this point. The idea is that the second your tip lands and you're in your ox and you know that after blow is company coming because, again, you are in the pocket, you throw the hanging on whatever side you think it's coming on and you try to stay safe. And again, we see a perfect example of the realities of being in the pocket where this person, instead of throwing it to any line that could be covered, threw the strike low at the hips and was able to land it despite the fact that Colin put a lot of effort into getting out of that range because when you're in the pocket, there's really not a lot you can do. So what the Zorn how or the Shield how, whatever you want to call it, allows you to do is it allows you to wait for those hand shots to come out when someone is trying to basically be non-committal and not enter that pocket range and force them into the pocket by coming forward with a little bit of momentum and zoning out the one place that you know their shot is very likely to be. It's really not all dissimilar from coming forward with a hanging parry in the same sense that what you're doing is you're aggressing your opponent, getting them into the range that you want, while throwing an attack that's just enough of a threat that they have to deal with it, but in reality is far more concerned with getting a dominant position and bind and ending up in the distance that you want to be in to continue the fight. I would even say that regardless of whether or not this thrust had landed, some similar sort of uh, play that we have seen in other parts would have transpired. So if we imagine here that this sword is not in this person's head, what can they do? Well, they can do exactly what they did, which is pull their sword back and go for a strike to the leg or the hip. But what could have happened here is Colin could have hung his guard and again, anticipating this right over how, which it seems like what he was anticipating anyway. And the second it missed coming down here, could have come around with a left over how and struck the head at the exact same time. Again, putting forward that same principle that we saw in the other section, where if you know that you can be hit, sometimes the best defense is making sure that your opponent knows that they have to sacrifice some part of themselves to hit you. So, if you're looking to try to put this sort of fencing into your own repertoire, what you're really looking to do is to have an opener that is not very much of a, an attack in the sense that you're trying to land a hit, but an attack in which you're trying to get a bind and you're trying to get to that distance. And what you want to try to do is you want to try to put yourself in the pocket as much as humanly possible. Work on your Zverkows, work on your hang and parries, and make sure that you're always throwing attacks that can also be turned into defenses once they land. If you can do those things and you can put those things into practice in your sparring, you're going to have a lot more success in that mid-range and it's going to give the grapplers who theoretically want to close the distance even further and shut you down something to think about and worry about as they're closing in with you. So that's going to be it for today. If you'd like to see your own uh, fight breakdown or style breakdown on the channel, feel free to send me some footage over at hemafightbreakdowns at gmail.com. And I hope to see you next time.